Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Search for Life panel at Space Symposium. I am very, very excited to be here uh, today, and I want to start by thanking the Space Foundation for hosting this panel uh, and for selecting it. And also want to thank all of you for, for making the trek out to Colorado Springs in a, in a challenging environment. My name is Jason Callerai. I am the Mission Area Executive for Civil Space at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab. I want to tell you a little bit about the Applied Physics Lab and our Civil Space Program and, and introduce this exciting topic that we're going to talk to you about today and then I'll introduce our moderator. Um, the Civil Space Program at APL is science-driven, space science-driven, and it's integrated within a NASA mission management framework. That framework starts with scientific research. We have 150 active space scientists who per partner with the space science community to identify what the top challenges are that we want to go after in our space exploration program. Once we identify those challenges, we have the capabilities to design, uh, build, uh, integrate, test, and operate complex science instruments and space missions to address those challenges. And of course, that framework ends with scientific research, with the worldwide space science community getting access to those data sets from those missions and addressing the challenges that motivated the missions. But in many cases, more importantly, opening up new mysteries that require new technology investments and new approaches to our future missions. Um, and that framework would not be possible without strategic partnerships across all of our programs, partnerships with industry, with academia, with NASA centers, with other government labs is essential uh, to our success. So just to highlight a couple of examples of the NASA space science missions that we have developed at APL, I want to start with a mission that we launched in 2004 called MESSENGER. MESSENGER was a mission, it was the first mission to successfully orbit the planet Mercury um, around the sun. And this is very challenging because of the gravitational pull of the sun at that radius, but we succeeded with that, achieving that orbit. And then the science results from MESSENGER were just breathtaking. MESSENGER found uh, evidence of uh, water ice and organic compounds at the poles of Mercury, for example. Another NASA mission that we developed at APL was New Horizons. We launched New Horizons in 2006, and in 2015, it flew past Pluto and opened our eyes to the wonders of that world. New Horizons is still very active today. In fact, it's 50 times further from the sun than the Earth is today. It's flying through a region in the remote outskirts of our solar system called the Kuiper Belt. And within that Kuiper Belt are fossils, fossils from the earliest days of the solar system that have remained relatively undisturbed. And by studying those fossils, we learn insights about the formation processes in the earliest days of our solar system four and a half billion years ago. A mission that we launched three years ago is called Parker Solar Probe. Parker is the boldest NASA heliophysics mission ever developed. It's the fastest human-made object ever. Uh, in April of this year, Parker Solar Probe traveled 330,000 miles per hour. It's a spacecraft that's literally flying through the atmosphere of the sun with technologies that protect the science instruments on the spacecraft and keep them at room temperature while the front of the spacecraft is, is at thousands of degrees. We've had hundreds of research papers published from Parker Solar Probe. And finally, in a couple of months, we're gonna be launching a NASA mission called DART, the Double Asteroid Redirection Test. This is NASA's first planetary defense mission where we're gonna take a spacecraft, use it as a kinetic impactor, and collide into an asteroid and deflect the orbit of that asteroid. It's a mission that one day could help protect our planet. Given our focus on space science, um, we're very, very excited to bring this panel to Space Symposium this year. The search for life, in my view, is one of the boldest pursuits uh, for all of humankind. Um, it's, a, it's a goal that when we answer that question, are we alone in the universe, will bring about a fundamental change in our worldview of who we are and how we fit into the cosmos. And I say that whether the answer to the question is a yes or no. It's equally powerful either way. And the timing for addressing that question is now. Due to a number of scientific discoveries, in fact, you can say the universe has been kind to us in addressing this question, new technologies, the rapid access to space, and the increased um, attention and focus that so many players uh, want to play in space exploration, we have an opportunity now in this generation to make huge strides in addressing this question. And our expert panel today is going to tell you all about that. 
So with that, I'd like to turn it over to our moderator today, Deepak Srinivasan. Uh, Deepak is going to say a few words about this topic and then introduce each of our uh, speakers today. All right. Thanks, Jason. So I'm Deepak Srinivasan with the Applied Physics Labs as well, and I am just really excited to be here to talk about this topic with this panel. Now I want to start off with this video, kind of level set everybody. So this is 1946, right after World War II, before the traditional start of what we consider the space age with, with Sputnik's launch in the next decade. What you're seeing here is a result of Operation Paperclip. We talked about that at one of the earlier sessions today. So the V-2 rockets that the Germans had developed, American scientists, along with some German scientists, studied rocket science here. And a couple engineers from APL decided, hey, let me try something. Let me try ruggedizing a camera, strap it onto one of these things, launch it, and see what happens. This is what happened. That camera provided the first images of Earth from outer space back in 1946. So this video, this grainy, beautiful video, is part of the reason that we're all here today doing all the wonderful things that we are doing in outer space. Fast forward to today, and you, you might have heard throughout this conference people referring to this second golden age of space exploration. That's what we're in right now. This is a very, very, very exciting time to be alive. We have so many missions going on all across the world, returning new information every day about these fundamental questions. Where do we come from? Are we alone? We're on the cusp of getting all the information that we need to start answering those questions. And this panel is going to start telling you guys a little bit about how we're going to get there. Our first speaker is Dr. Thomas Rubukin. He's the Associate Administrator of NASA's Science Mission Director at SMD. He's going to talk about how SMD overall is working to address answering those questions of, is there life out there? Are we alone? After he gives you that overview, he's going to hand it off to Dr. Elizabeth Zibby Turtle, a colleague of mine from APL. She's the principal investigator for the Dragonfly mission, which is going to be flying to Saturn's moon Titan. She's going to talk about why ocean worlds are going to provide a key component to answering those questions about where did life come from. Zibby's then going to hand it off to Dr. Mercedes uh, Lopez Morales from the Harvard Smithsonian Institute for Astrophysics. Mercedes is going to take that search for life beyond our solar system to exoplanets, planets orbiting other stars. She's going to talk about how we can use, how we are using current space telescopes, the most powerful telescopes there are, as well as uh, telescopes that we plan on deploying in the upcoming years, how we're going to be able to look for Earth-like planets beyond our solar system. Lastly, uh, Mr. Tommy Sanford from the Commercial Space Flight Federation is going to talk about how do we make these missions happen. Uh, as Jason mentioned before, we rely on public-private partnerships to realize all of these missions, do them reliably, and at a price point that is acceptable for everybody. So with that, Thomas, the floor is yours. There you go. I don't know about you, but I love Colorado. And I love Colorado because just like where I grew up, I'm in the mountains and I'm almost a mile closer to the stars. And I see the stars every night. When I was out there, I looked at the star, and especially I looked up north, roughly in that direction. And I want you to do that tonight. And I want you to think about the stars and how amazing they are. And especially when you look at the stars, you immediately know what you're looking at is important, more important than you are, probably. Look at the order, look at the worlds that are there. And science helps you see the beauty of these stars. I want to show you one of those pictures that was taken in the year two, in the 2000s, early 2000s, with the Hubble Space Telescope, the most amazing telescope ever built, especially in the civilian world, looking at the stars, looking at the worlds out there. And this is what it shows. It's actually looking roughly in the direction that I just pointed, up north there in Ursa Maior. And it's looking at the space. Now, let me just uh, show you what the space is. This is a penny. And on there is Lincoln. 
and the eye of Lincoln is a sm very small area. So imagine taking an arm, stretching it out, looking into the sky, and not look at the star, but the darkest space you could look at with that telescope and just waiting and collecting photons. What you see is this. In that eye of Lincoln, stretched out with a penny, are tens of thousands of galaxies. You tile the whole sky with that little angle of that eye, you get to 100 billion galaxies or more. Each of them, like our own galaxies, has hundreds of billions of stars. And of course, just like you, just like me, and just like when I was a little kid, on the back in the Swiss mountains where I still have the accent from, I tried to lose it forever, but it's <laughs> not working. I thought about the questions like this. It's important out there. Where did this universe begin? How does it work? What's out there? And most importantly, is somebody looking back at me in the other direction? Astrobiology is how we, question, we talk about aspects of that uh, today. Astrobiology, looking for life out there, is a science that is making progress at a rate that's unprecedented in history. And we're right in the middle of a revolution of thinking of that. Our colleagues are going to talk about that. And in, in science, frankly, we're thinking of astrobiology, searching for life elsewhere as one of three themes that are dominating all of what we do, together with protecting and improving life on Earth and in space. The most beautiful planet we've ever seen, right here, uh, is our home. I have two kids. I want to leave it better than what I saw. That's what our observations in and from space do, understanding that as a system, and of course, discovering the secrets of the universe uh, that are there. Searching for life elsewhere is what we do looking at two domains that are really critical and complementary. The first one is the knowledge of space environments that are out there. We, of course, know one space environment. Once you leave the Earth, we take measurements. There are surprising things out there. Van Allen, with his first Explorer 1 rocket, found this radiation mold, exciting uh, spaces out there, all the way to where the Voyagers are, which are you know, historic, have been there all my life. Uh, and uh, basically looking at the environment of space. Some of the environments very, very different than the ones that are here now. And then, of course, the knowledge and evolution of Earth's biosphere and organism. The way I think about it, life right now, experimentally, is an N equals one thing. We know one life. Every life you've ever met, all your history, uh, everything that you're looking at is N equals one, one life. And the surprises about life itself relate, of course, to n equals many. And that's what searching for life is about, going from n equals one to n equals many. So the questions that we're looking at fall in three areas, and our colleagues are going to talk about them in various ways. Habitability. If there's a certain space somewhere, how habitable is it? We already talked about the question of water being an important part. You say, why is water so important? Well, we know from cosmology, the origin of the universe, there's a lot of hydrogen in there, there's a lot of oxygen. Oxygen is one of the toughest things. It, it destroys every chemical bound, any complexity. So you want to tie it up somewhere. Water is the perfect way to do that. And frankly, it also then moves chemicals around. Habitability is where that happens. Prebiotic chemistry is precisely about how those molecules form and evolve. And then, of course, it crosses over through something that is yet covered in the, in the fog of ignorance, which is signs of life elsewhere that we have not observed yet, that we want to observe and we are dreaming about every night, about how we're doing that and that we're getting closer to it. Of course, if you look at this, uh, you look at our star and you look at the environment, the space environment, or you look at the star, uh, you know, look at it during the day, either here from Colorado and elsewhere, and you look at, at the evolution of the star, the activities, of course, that are part of our life environment, including how radio waves propagate, space weather effects, and others that are there, and of course, the beautiful magnetic structures that are there. We know that such magnetic structures and much more violent ones are elsewhere in the universe. You're going to talk to us about that, Mercedes, as well as others. That matters. The stellar environment really, really matters about the question related to the question whether there's life elsewhere. Our star 
can help us a lot about this, but we need to look at other stars uh, to learn about it more. We look at that the environment overall and that big space that's carved out by the sun and its emission, its atmosphere, it's constantly blowing away, called the solar wind. That sphere or kind of body, which we call heliosphere, it's not spherical, you can look at it, but that body is, is explored right now in very few points. We talked about uh, new horizons out there, uh, but of course the voyagers that are there at various distances, uh, we're sitting in the center of it, really near uh, the sun, that one, we call it astronomical unit, one sun-Earth distance. Uh, Voyager is now at 125 and it's trickling back bits per second, OD 72. Uh, meter antennas, pre bravely doing so as we're running out of power because, of course, even though radioactive decays of plutonium is pretty long, it's still finite compared to the lives of uh, Voyager, so the power is going down. I just want to tell you how excited we are to still learn about this. But when we get closer to us and getting to the middle uh, part there is really the incredible speed of discovery that relates to water. There's many such charts we could make, but I want to talk to you about water because frankly, okay, I'm going to tell you how old I am. Well, not really. My PhD is in 96. And many of the classes that I was taught there were very incomplete. Because in 96, much of what we know about water today in the solar system was not known, including at Mars, Enceladus, this amazing uh, kind of moon that spurts out there by um, uh, Saturn, spurts out organics and water into space, Europa, exoplanets, uh, the first exoplanet, uh, two exoplanets of course being announced in 1995 in a conference in Rome. Remember how I talked about N equals one? Until then we had N equals one solar system and there were all these amazing theories that I learned in class well, let me tell you, the books today look very different because we went from N equals one to N equals many. The first two uh, planets that were discovered destroyed the theories, the vast majority of the, th the uh, series. And by the way, by doing that, taught us about our own solar system in a way we never knew how to look at. Uh, and so for me, that's what's really happening. And of course, Titan has a similar type of story uh, with uh, Voyager flybys. I just talked about the Voyagers. Then the Cassini-Huygens uh, probes uh, on Titan. And then, of course, Cassini looking through the haze and uh, in 2027, Dragonfly. And of course, uh, Sibi, the next speaker, is imminently more cool than I am because she is the principal investigator of that mission. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Sibi. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, I'm Zibby Turtle. Uh, I'm the principal investigator of the Dragonfly New Frontiers mission to Titan, and I'm the principal investigator of the Europa Imaging System on Europa Clipper, and I'm very pleased to be here today to talk to you about upcoming exploration of ocean worlds. As Thomas described, uh, one of the big surprises uh, in our solar system has been not only the existence, but the prevalence of oceans in worlds uh, throughout the outer solar system. And these worlds and their oceans offer insights into fundamental aspects of habitability and the origins of life. We don't know how life came to form here on Earth. So we look to places elsewhere in the solar system that can provide clues to this puzzle of the processes that led to life. And we're fortunate to have a wide diversity of ocean worlds within reach in our solar system to explore. So I'll talk briefly about three different missions that are in development to explore ocean worlds. One is NASA's Europa Clipper mission. Another is ESA's Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, or JUICE. And the third is NASA's uh, Dragonfly New Frontiers mission. So Europa Clipper is a spacecraft that will go into orbit around Jupiter, and it will perform 40 to 50 very low altitude flybys of Europa, down to about 25 kilometers altitude over the surface of Europa. And it has a payload that is designed to investigate the habitability of Europa. To 
characterize aspects of the ice shell and the ocean, including the possibility of exchange between the surface and the interior ocean, and vice versa. Europa Clipper will also measure the, the composition of Europa to understand aspects of the habitability of the ocean. And it will study the geologic processes at work in the ice shell, especially whether there is evidence of recent or even current geologic activity. The JUICE mission is also a spacecraft that will go into orbit initially around Jupiter. And it will do a series of flybys of Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. And then it will go into orbit around Ganymede. And it too has a payload that is designed to study aspects of the Jovian system as a potential archetype for gas giants. And to study details of the satellites, especially Ganymede, which not only has an interior liquid water ocean, but also generates its own magnetic field. So I'll go into a little more depth about exploration of Saturn's moon Titan. Titan is really unique among the ocean worlds in that it has an atmosphere. Its atmosphere is actually denser than our atmosphere here on Earth. And this atmosphere means that on the surface of Titan, all of the ingredients necessary for life as we know it have had the opportunity to mix, possibly for extended periods of time. So there's energy in the form of sunlight that drives very rich photochemistry in Titan's atmosphere that generates complex carbon molecules. And these molecules fall out of the atmosphere onto the surface. They litter the surface um, where they've had the opportunity to mix with liquid water in the past uh, on the surface at sites of melting of Titan's crust, for example, impact craters or cryovolcanoes. Uh, but there's also the possibility to mix with another liquid because Titan has two liquids in its system, and the other is methane. There's a methane cycle on Titan, like our water cycle here on Earth, and there are methane clouds and rain and uh, rivers and lakes and seas. And it's possible that methane could support the development of exotic biological systems. So Dragonfly is a mobile lander, and in fact, there's a half-scale model of Dragonfly at the APL uh, exhibit, uh, just, just up, up the, uh, the street. Dragonfly is designed to study aspects of habitability. What makes a world habitable? What are the chemical processes that led to the development of life? And even has life developed elsewhere in our solar system? As, as Thomas, put, Thomas puts it, put it, is n greater than one in terms of life in our solar system. Dragonfly, Dragonfly's payload is designed to focus on prebiotic chemistry. What are the chemical components available on Titan's surface and what processes are at work? And are they producing biologically relevant compounds? And we put this into the context of Titan's environment, the uh, atmosphere and the methane cycle understanding the formation of organic materials and the transport and mixing of those materials on the surface of Titan, and the opportunities for those materials to mix with liquid water uh, on Titan's surface or in its interior. And then Dragonfly is also capable of searching for chemical evidence of biological processes. If chemistry in Titan's past actually took the leap to biology, which we do not know yet, over the course of the mission, Dragonfly will traverse 100 miles across the surface of Titan, exploring a region around a large impact crater where organic material and liquid water may have had the opportunity to mix for thousands or tens of thousands of years. And what we want to understand is how far organic synthesis can proceed in, a, in this environment. So thanks to Titan's low gravity, which is about one-seventh the gravity here on Earth, and its dense atmosphere, which is about four times the density of the atmosphere on Earth, it's actually physically easier to fly on Titan than it is here. And so Dragonfly is a different kind of lander. It's an octocopter, which will fly from place to place, bringing its entire payload to explore different areas on Titan. Very similar to our mobile exploration on Mars, except instead of driving, we will be flying. And we bring everything with us. We pre-scout our own landing sites, and we um, 
transmit the data directly from the surface of Titan back to Earth before we take off to soar through the skies of another world and see what's beyond the horizon. And we want to expand horizons here on Earth as well, providing opportunities to broaden participation in a wide variety of aspects of mission development, spacecraft exploration, across disciplines of STEM and STEAM, and to reach out to the next generation of explorers. And with that, I will turn it over to Mercedes, who's going to talk about worlds beyond our solar system. Thank you, CV, so much. So, you know, as CV and her group and other uh, planetary scientists are looking for life in the solar system, simultaneously, we're also trying to find life around other stars. Planets around other stars is what we call exoplanets. Um, and basically, uh, until recently, we didn't know that they existed. But thanks to the NASA Kepler mission that flew between 2009 and 2013, now we know that pretty much every single star that you see at night must have one or more planets. This is where we were at the beginning of the 20th century. Nothing happened for a long time. And then all of a sudden, about 26 years ago, we discovered, as Thomas was saying, the first exoplanets. Thanks to a number of missions and ground-based telescopes, now we have been discovering planets using different techniques to the point that, as of today, in 2021, we have about 23,000 candidates, of which we have confirmed about 4,000 of them. These planets in this circle are what we call rocky planets. Basically, those are planets that we believe have some, like a solid surface where life could actually begin and evolve. However, if you see where Venus and Earth sit in that plot, you see that we haven't found any Venus or Earthly planets yet. But we are coming. This is gonna happen in the next few years. We have a few missions already looking for these planets. For example, the NASA test mission or the uh, ESA Gaia mission. And we are also building the Nancy Roman Space Telescope, which I will show you towards the end what, we'll, what it will do. We're also looking for these planets with ground-based telescopes and instruments, especially the new generation of extremely large telescopes that are being built on the ground. And with all this, this is where we expect to be in, you know, in the next about five years, by 2026. Now, if you look again at the planets in that circle, you see that in five years, we will have several planets that are like Venus and Earth. We still will not have found anything like Mars or Mercury. But Mars, uh, Venus and Earth, we will have a handful of them. So what is next? Well, the next thing that we are gonna do is to try to detect the atmospheres of those planets. And this is how we do it. Basically, when a planet passes in front of a star, part of the light of the star gets absorbed by the atmosphere and part of it gets transmitted towards us. If you have some molecules in the atmosphere, the light that gets transmitted gets either absorbed or reflected by the atmosphere of the planet. And from the point of view of Earth, if we are staring at that system and we take that light from the star that went through the atmosphere and we split it into colors, we basically see that there is some colors missing. Those missing colors tell us what the atmosphere of the planet is made of. In this case, this particular planet would have water, would have carbon dioxide, and, would, and you know, it would have methane. We have done this with a number of large um, planets like Saturn's, Jupiter's, Neptune's, and we are getting pretty good at it. But we now have to figure out how to do it for the smaller planets, for the Earth analogs. And the most exciting system that we have found so far is a system called TRAPPIST-1. As I showed you before, we haven't found anything like Earth. This system has seven planets that we think could be like Earth. The problem here, as Thomas was talking about, is that the star is not like the sun. The star is what we call an M dwarf, and M dwarfs are super active. So we don't know what these planets are like, whether they can host life or not, but this is the perfect system for us right now 
to see if we can detect the atmospheres and to see if those atmospheres actually look like Earth, especially the planets that you see around the, the green zone. That's the habitable zone of that star. So with the Hubble Space Telescope in 2018, I think, we actually um, tried to do this. And basically what we tried to do at the time with Hubble was to see if the absorption from, the, from, from all the planets in the TRAPPIST-1 system look like the top diagram that you see on the right side, which would mean that the signal is large, and that would mean that the planet has a hydrogen atmosphere, something like Jupiter, Saturn, or Neptune. That's not habitable. The pressure inside the planet, well, first, we, it might not have a surface, and even if it did, the pressure would be so high that we couldn't live there. Life probably couldn't exist in there. The bottom uh, panel on the right is how the atmosphere of the planet would look like if the planets in the, tra in, in the TRAPPIST system had atmospheres similar to the terrestrial planets in our solar system, like Venus, uh, Mars, Earth. So we observed all those planets with uh, Hubble, and this is what we saw. The yellow points here are the actual observations. So you see that we actually could tell already that these planets are not like Saturn, Jupiter, or Neptune. These planets are smaller. They have smaller atmospheres, either like terrestrial atmospheres, or you know, it could be that they are bare planets, that they don't have any atmospheres at all, because the radiation coming from the star has wiped out the atmosphere. Unfortunately, this is all that we can do with Hubble right now, because the telescope is not big enough. But here comes the James Webb Space Telescope, which is about to be launched. And this is what we will be able to do with a James Webb Telescope. This diagram that I show you here on the top left is a simulation of how do we think James Webb will see these planets in the TRAPPIST-1 system. The yellow points are the actual observations, and the blue line is a model that, in this case, contains, let me see, water, carbon dioxide, and ozone. So with James Webb, we will be able to tell you exactly what the planets in the TRAPPIST-1 system are made of. Remember what I showed you for 2026, right? That we will have about five to 10 planets like Venus or Earth. James Webb is gonna be able to detect the atmospheres of those planets. And before the end of this, this decade, we will have a sample of about half a dozen to a dozen planets for which we will be able to tell you how like the Earth they are. Moving forward towards the future a little bit, you know, a few more years, the next uh, NASA mission that is being built is the Nancy Roman um, uh, Space Telescope. Nancy Roman is going to tell us how common planets like Earth are in the galaxy. And this is how it's going to do it. Remember this diagram from 2026? By the time that Nancy Roman is done observing, it will add all these yellow points that you see here. And now we will have a lot of planets, potentially like Earth, to go after. No other mission has been approved at this point um, for what comes after Nancy Grace. Um, I was hoping that the results of the uh, Decadal Astro 2020 survey were out before this meeting, but they are not. So, um, Hopefully, the recommendation of the next decadal survey by the, astronomy, the astronomy community will recommend a mission that will allow us to observe the atmospheres of many of those planets, and hopefully within the next couple of decades, we will be able to tell you exactly how common Earth is in the galaxy. So with that exciting uh, prospect, I will leave you with uh, Tommy now. Thank you. Thank you, Mercedes. One quick disclaimer. While I am the executive director of the Commercial Spaceflight Federation, I'm here speaking broadly on behalf of industry as a member of the NASA Planetary Protection Independent Review Board, not on behalf of CSF. Thank you, Space Foundation, for hosting the 36th Space Symposium, and APL for hosting the Search for Life panel. Today, the commercial space industry is helping in the search for life in many ways, both big and small, in some ways that are obvious and other ways that are not. For example, a not so obvious example, 
are public-private partnerships on suborbital flights, which are helping in the search for life on Mars. The Jet Propulsion Laboratory's latest Mars lander, uh, land, um, lander was able to pro uh, flight prove its approach and landing sensor package and software using a reusable launch vehicle. In fact, testing on a commercial suborbital rocket increased the technology readiness level to get the flight uh, final green light of acceptance into the Mars 2020 mission. Another not so obvious example of public-private partnerships helping in the search for life in the universe are commercial remote sensing satellites in Earth orbit. While Earth may not appear to benefit the search for life, many of the Earth observing science spacecraft are excellent examples as Earth is the only planet where we know life already exists. Data from space observatories around Earth are key to understanding the possibility of life elsewhere. A more obvious example of public-private partnerships helping in the search for life are commercial spacecraft, landers, and in-space manufacturing capabilities that are helping expand our sustainable reach into the solar system. The last example here is the Lunar Surface Innovation Consortium, driven by NASA's STMD. This is a nationwide alliance of government agencies, industries, nonprofits, and academia, facilitated by APL, intended to harness the diverse creativity and capabilities across all these sectors to help establish our sustained presence on the moon. Here we will see a video showing a great example of the partnerships I've been talking about. It is the prequel to the video that Zibi showed of the Dragonfly descent. The crew stage of the Dragonfly mission and the aeroshell developed by Lockheed Martin with additional entry, descent, and landing expertise from NASA's Ames and NASA Langley is bringing the landing system to Titan. The aeroshell is deployed and begins the descent into Titan's atmosphere. This descent is slow, a slow one. Instead of the seven minutes of terror characteristic of the recent Mars landings, Titan's dense atmosphere and low gravity allow for a slower landing sequence with multiple chute deployments on the order of 110 minutes. After the heat shield separates, the Dragon, uh, Dragonfly rotorcraft releases from the aeroshell and begins its powered descent to the surface, which you saw earlier during Zibby's talk. This is a terrific example of industry collaboration. Industry can help drive innovation and help lower costs, which results in increased opportunities for more science. Here I use a comparison between the space shuttle and commercial launch vehicles to illustrate this point. Here's a 2021 NASA Inspector General report, which shows in comparison to the space shuttle, commercial space companies having lowered the cost of launch to LEO per pound from $25,000 to $1,250. This lower cost has increased more opportunities for science. As you can see on this slide, commercial launch vehicles have significantly lowered the cost of launch for missions to Jupiter over the last three decades, from almost $900 million for Galileo to $248 million for Juno and $178 million for Europa Clipper. As you can see from this slide, the cost of science can be significant. In this instance, the increase in shuttle costs from delays overall for Galileo cost the science community another whole mission of equal complexity to Jupiter. As you can see from this slide, the increased opportunities for science can be significant. In this instance, the low cost development, operations, and dissimilar redundancy of commercial cargo resupply has increased the opportunities for new scientific research on the ISS. The opportunity to fly new research to the ISS increased significantly from the shuttle era, expeditions 1 through 28, to the commercial space era, expeditions 32 to 66. So how can we can continue to improve? More of this. And by that I mean increased communication with one another, empathy for one another, understanding of each other, recognition that we all share the same goals, too often we are comfortable in our own silos, which results in us talking past one another. But when we have more panels like this one, we get out of our silos, talk to each other, and realize that we share similar goals and passions. 
We realize we want the same things, more great science and more opportunities for science. So thank you, J APL, for hosting this panel and for my colleagues on this panel to help improve our efforts and I look forward to the next opportunity to work together. Nice job. So we have literally 20 seconds for Q&A, which <laughs> means there's no Q&A, my apologies for that. Um, but as you heard, we have a very talkative panel here, and I'm sure they'd be more than happy to stick around for a little bit. And I, there's a set of very good questions that came in, and I encourage you guys to ask the panelists um, after the show. Um, but I did want to close really quickly with this. This is more addressed to a specific segment of all of you out there, specifically the young professionals, the early career folks. You guys are critical to ensuring the success of everything that you've heard today from this panel, as well as every other mission or every other thrust area that you've heard throughout this conference. You guys are critical to making it all work. What you see here is actually a picture from the Galileo mission. Right now, this is a picture of, of, uh, of Europa. It's the best resolution image we have to date. It's pretty good. What you see here is actually an image of Marguerite Bay in Antarctica. I want to focus in on that little bit right there. Once the Europa imaging system, which is actually led by Zibi, starts delivering its data, this is the resolution of the imagery that we expect to get from Europa. It's, it's astounding. You know, you're looking at this thing and it's, wow, this is what we're going to be achieving. The thing to keep in mind, though, is that these missions are long duration missions. It takes years to figure out what you want to do, then another set of years to actually build the mission. Then in some cases, it takes many more years to get to where you want to go, followed by many more years, hopefully, of scientific exploration and study and getting that data. The people that are doing this work is probably not going to be many of us on the stage here. It's going to be all the young professionals out there right now. You guys are the ones that are going to be operating that spacecraft or other spacecraft like that. You guys are going to be the ones that are getting the data back. You're going to be the ones that are studying the data. You're the ones that are going to be figuring out what is that data telling us. What new missions should we do based on that data? Missions that the people here haven't even thought of yet. You're the ones that are going to do that mission. And then at the 56th Space Symposium, you're the ones that are going to be standing here telling the next generation that, hey, you guys got to join us in this cycle. This is what the, how the cycle looks like, and you're a part of that cycle. And we're critical to, you guys are critical to making sure this all happens. So on that note, let's get out there and do it. And thank you very much for attending this, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.